So we've got a new laser in the workshop that can only mean one thing, let's burn some more stuff. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel, love laser or CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Saiyan Smart Genmitsu Jinsoku LC40. I do wish they would give them shorter names, it would make these videos so much easier. Now I should also state we are recording this as pre-production, so effectively the machine I've got in front of me today comes straight from the factory almost as a test product. So if you find any niggles or glitches, we can get that back to Science Smart and it can all be improved by the time this machine actually goes on sale. Now we're gonna do a full video on this today. We're gonna to do the build of it, we're gonna do the specs of it, and then we're gonna do a review of it towards the end. Obviously, if you wanna to skip to any sections, use the chapters functions either at the bottom of the video or in the description area below. Now, this is the laser itself. And already we can see straight away, it's a bit different from their usual much sleeker much nicer to look at visually so certainly a step forward but let's get stuck in straight away and talk about the specs of this machine well let's start with the obvious thing the frame itself this is made of an aluminium profile not the aluminium extrusion that you're used to seeing on previous lasers it is essentially a smoother sleeker looking frame and it's more of a casing than a frame if that makes sense it's there it holds everything together and keeps it rigid but it also can contains the mechanism that the laser actually runs on. Now it is belt driven and again all these belts are hidden and contained within this framework but the actual axis run on high speed linear rails. Now one huge benefit to linear rails is there are a lot less there's less friction than there is with using um, the rubber wheels. So essentially everything moves much smoother and easier. Less friction means less wear. So all round it's just going to be a smoother operation operation for this to run and usually probably a little bit quieter as well. But as I say, all of these mechanisms are hidden really well in this aluminium casing profile. So that all adds to, you know, essentially how sexy this machine actually looks and how sleek it looks. The stepper motors for driving it have, all, have been molded into the actual shape of the frame as well. So they, they don't really extend out to the side or protrude. Again, just all helping to that look. There, as I say, driving the belts underneath here and these do have it just as they can be tightened or loosened if needed. So although everything is hidden, you still have the functions to be able to, you know, tension them up if needed. Each axis has its own stepper mode. So we have one either side for both of the separate Y axis, and then we have one for the X axis as well. The Z adjustment on this is manual, so there's no um, stepper motor to rise this up and down. It is quite simple. There is just a small knob that you can turn to lower it or higher it and then tighten it back up. That also basically runs on a linear rail as well. So it is quite smooth to lower it and higher it. The laser itself is a 5 watt laser. Now this is a pre-production unit using what is called the compressed module. What that basically means is the focus of the laser and the power of the laser is compressed into a slightly smaller point. Usually better for cutting because you're going to get more power hitting a smaller spot. Now what Science Smart are doing is effectively going to be releasing two versions of this machine one with a standard laser and one with the compressed laser. Obviously the reason for this is not everybody needs that extra compression of the laser for cutting and things like that. So it keeps the price point fairly balanced for those who don't really want it for cutting more for engraving. They can just go with the normal five watt laser as opposed to the five watt compressed beam laser. On top of the laser is also the cooling fan, but this acts as part of the air assist. So there is a little flow mechanism inside here, which basically as the air moves down the laser, it then just moves it to one side and scoops it back underneath the laser lens itself. Obviously air assist is crucial for whenever you're lasering things because the smoke can block the lens up and make it dirty and obviously affect how efficient your laser is actually operating. So whilst it's not full air assist, it is a passive air assist in that you have got active airflow going underneath the laser itself to keep it clean. And it basically just throws the, um, the air out the back of the laser, pushing that smoke away from the front of it. We can also see as well on the front of the laser that we've got this bit of a laser shield going on. It is just on the front, not on the side. So that allows you to see what is going on, but obviously also give you some protection as well whenever you are looking at it. As I always say, 
if you're staring at it for a long time, do make sure you wear proper goggles. These are kind of like half protection, if that makes sense. They're going to block out some of the light, but proper laser goggles will help, obviously, to protect your eyes altogether. The actual work area of the machine, now it is listed basically as a 400 by 400 machine, but the actual working area is a bit smaller than that. It's about 390 by about 360 is the full area that you can engrave in. One of the reasons for this, there are limit switches fitted to this. Limit switches usually minimize the amount of travel you can have because it has to allow a little bit for that limit switch to be activated. The official size of the machine is 553 by 543 with a height of 207. So basically that is the size that you will need to drop this on. Obviously you always want to allow a little bit of room around the outside just to cover for movement and things. But 553 by 543 207 is the room you need to actually run this. And running all this hardware is a 32-bit control board that is tucked very neatly in this back piece of aluminium profile here. So you've got no clunky control boards on the outside. Now, what a 32-bit control board basically means is everything's going to be a little bit faster, a little bit smoother, and sometimes it also means the stepper motors run a little bit quieter as well. The control board is also advertised as being able to run two different firmware. Now, I'll come on to this a little bit later in the video because it's a slight niggle that I've got. But basically, what it means is that you can run this machine straight out of the box using your mobile phone. You don't need to connect it to a PC or anything like that. Everything can be done via Bluetooth using an app on your mobile phone. Other type of firmware that they reference is basically running it as normal as we typically expect on something like a PC or laptop using Lightburn or Laser GRB. So if you do see this being referenced as running two different firmware, that's basically what it means. One is to be able to run it on your mobile, the other is to be able to run it from your PC. Now we've already referenced that this is a 5 watt laser. It can also take up to an 8 watt laser. So basically if you want to upgrade this in the future to a more powerful laser, it can take up to an 8 watt laser, meaning you don't need a separate supply power supply in order to run that. Now it is also advertised at being able to run this laser at 170 millimeters per second, which is just over 10,000 millimeters per minute. So pretty high speeds basically, and obviously that's all helped by the setup of the belts and the linear rails. Now I don't really know what it's capable of engraving at that speed, maybe we'll find out a little bit later. We also have a couple of buttons and ports on the back, and I'll quickly run through those from left to right. Starting off, we have the power button, obviously, to turn it on and off. Next to that, we have the job repeat button. So basically, whenever you send a job to this machine via your phone or something, it stores it in the memory of the control board. And if you want to run that job again straight away, you press the repeat button and it will simply do the same job again. This could be useful if perhaps you've run a job and it wasn't at a high enough power. So you could run it again and it will basically double up the power and therefore maybe get a better engraving. Next to that is what is referenced in the instruction manual as a USB-C port or a USB-C interface. Now, I wasn't quite sure of what this was at first, but what it is actually for is this can take a rotary attachment that uses a USB-C port. So this USB connector on the back of this machine will allow it to connect to the rotary attachment whenever that comes out from SoundSmart. So usually what you would have to do is like disconnect um, one of the Y axis or something to make the rotary work, but it can be done from this USB port. Next to that is the USB type B port, which is the interface for connecting it to your PC. And then next to that is obviously the power input to obviously give enough power to your machine to allow it to run. So both stylistically and hardware, it's a big step forward from what SoundSmart are used to producing, such as the LC60 or the LE1620 behind me in the corner. And it is clearly there to compete against another manufacturer that's been flooding the market recently. Now, setup is also super simple, just a couple of bolts to basically get everything together. So let's take a quick look at that now. So this is essentially everything you get in the kit. You've got your left and right Y axis, your X axis, where the laser connects to, your front support beam, back support beam that also has the control board, and you can see the various connection ports as well as the on and off switch. We've got a couple of cables that join all these up and allow everything to work. Your power adapter, obviously, depending whether you get a UK plug, US plug, obviously related to your country. The laser itself, very important. We'll take a closer look at this in another segment. We've got a couple of cable tidies that help hold the cables in place on the frame. The bolts for assembly, now I can see straight away we've got four of one kind, 12 of another. 
which means this is probably going to be super simple to assemble. So we're starting off with the Y axis, the left and right sides. We've flipped them upside down and rested them on the foam packaging that comes in the box. And I've put a piece of wood either side to support this. The reason being is the bolts go in from underneath. So by flipping everything over, it makes it easier for us to get the bolts in place. We're also then going to connect the front support beam. Now in the support beam, there are ridges taken out to go into these plates here where the bolts go. So we'll just slide this into place now and we'll bring in one of the bolts from the pack of 12 and just start to get this in place. So that's in place now and the bolts tightened up. Quick tip, you will have seen a magnet on the Allen key. And the reason for this, obviously, to hold them in place. So it can just take the weight of the bolt while you're trying to get them into the hole. So it just makes life that bit easier. What we'll do now is spin it round and get the, um, the back plate in place as well. And we've got some couple of cable cables to take care of. So I've flipped the frame around and just rested the back support in place. Now, as we can see, we've got a few cables on either end. Now, there is a bit of play on these cables, but what I would say is it's better to connect the cables first than trying to get them in later on. So use something like the foam to support it and just make sure you connect the cables up first. They usually only go in one way. There's a couple of um, lining, li lining pins on the side. So they dictate which way the male and female go together push them in, they usually click, and we'll do the same on both sides. The little two pin connector goes into the frame under here. There is just a small hole where we can plug it in. And again, make sure you use the aligning pins to make sure it goes in the same, the correct way, sorry. So we'll just place that in, and again, it should click into place. So with the cables connected, I've just touched, pushed the connectors slightly into the beam itself. We're then gonna flip this over and get it in place so we can connect the holes to the beam with the remaining bolts. So flip that over, slide the one side in. That's probably one of the most difficult parts, trying to get the cables into the slots and get the beam in place. But now we've done that, we're gonna drop the remaining bolts in. What I'm gonna do is tighten most of them up, but not too tight, and then just go around and check how square the frame is before we pinch everything up, as we've done in previous videos. So I'll insert the remaining bolts now, and then we'll check for square in a second. So we've got all eight bolts in the frame and now what we've done is left them slightly loose to check the square and make sure we can pinch everything up and keep the frame as square as possible. Now the easiest method is to use a tape measure and go corner to corner in opposite directions. Now the reason I'm using a tape measure and not something like a set square is because the height of the front and back beams is different to the height of the side beams. So actually using a square in the corner can be quite difficult. And the inner edges of these feet are radius as well. So you're gonna to struggle to get it right into the corner. So we'll use the tape measure and we'll go diagonally between the bottoms of the feet. And then we'll do it the opposite way as well. And I can see mine is just a fraction out with it being um, wider that way than it is that way. Now, because we've left some slack in the frame itself, we can move this about. So what I'm gonna do is now is just move it slightly, go around it and start to pinch the bolts up until we get this square. Better to start one side and then just work your way around. I say, tightening everything up, keep checking the square each time you do it. So all the frame is now square. I've pinched all the bolts back up to make sure this is tight. We can flip it over and get the X axis dropped on. So flip the frame over, we've got the X axis in place. Now what we're going to do is connect the two cables on the one end first before bolting this into place, again, just to make it easier. Same principles apply. There's two little guiding fins on the one side that ensure it only goes into the hole the one way. So we'll make sure we connect the males up to the females Obviously trying to do this on camera, it's always a bit difficult, but hopefully I can just get this in. So there we go, the two cables are now in place. We can rest the axe axis ax, ax, onto the carriages, pull them in, and again, there are two bolts on either side in order to put the screws in. Now do make sure your carriages are as parallel as possible in order to keep the X axis um, in line with the front and back. On the one side to get the two bolts in, there are thin channels going in between the case in here. So that may be slightly difficult to get them in, but let's see how we get on. So we've got the four bolts in place. I found it easier to use a slightly longer um, Allen key. Obviously it just gave me a bit more grip and positioning. 
Do be careful when pulling this in. The cables do come very tight to the edge on this side. You want to make sure you don't pinch them together. So with the basis of the frame assembled, let's move on and get the laser attached. So to do this, we're going to use the pack of shorter bolts. Again, I'm just going to put it on the end of the Allen key. And it's quite simple, four bolts on the back of the laser holder, four bolts on the positioning guide. And we'll just put that in, align the holes up and tighten them up. Obviously do that for all four. Don't pinch it up too much once you're getting the first one in, just use it as a positioning guide. And then at least get the second one in to hold it up parallel. And once you've done that, the other two should go in nice and easy. So there are two different cables that come with the laser, a long one and a short one. Also the longer one has a white JST terminal, so you can easily differentiate the two of them. Now the one with the JST connector goes from the laser to the port on the side here. So again we can push that in, making sure the locator fins on the side go in the correct way. Just push that in until it clicks, and then put in the USB-C terminal into the port on the side as well. Then we can use some of the cable clips provided to put the cable to the side and just try and sit this in comfortably. They can be a bit tight, but with a bit of pressure, they should pop in. There we are, that one's in. As I say, it does take a little bit of pressure. They are designed to hold them in place very tightly, but we can just go round then and put the ones on the back as well. So slide that across, take another one of the connectors, put that in, position it up, and again, a bit of pressure. And then just one more that sits in the middle hole to hold the cable in place. And we do a similar process with the other cable. Now on the shorter cable, there is also a long and a short end. The shorter end goes into the side of the machine here, next to the where the other terminal was. And you'll see there's a hole that right next to it. And then the other end comes around the back here, and there should be another port. And it just goes in there. And then we can do exactly the same with the cable clip holders and try and get these in place. Just again, a little bit of pressure. That is one in and one on the back. And that's all the cabling now in position. So as soon as you turn the machine on, two things will happen and don't be alarmed by them. The first one is the laser will actually come on, but this is a very low power, it's just a couple of percent. It will not burn or engrave anything, so don't worry about that. The second one is it will home the machine, and I'll show you this now. So what it's effectively doing is looking for the various limit switches on each of the axes so it knows its starting position or its home position. So it will run them both simultaneously until it finds it, then return it all the way back to the home position, which is the back left corner. Setting the focal depth on this is super easy and it all ties in with keeping this machine as clean and tidy as possible. So over here on the right hand side, there is actually a removable piece. And if I just put my nail in there and pop it out, we get this little five millimeter spacer, which is the space required from the bottom of the laser to your material. So you simply place that underneath your material, unscrew the um, thread on the side, lower the laser down until it touches that five millimeter block tighten it back up. That's now set the best focal depth for the laser. You can take that out of the way, place it back in the holder, and you're good to go. Installing the app is extremely easy. You can either scan the QR codes on the instructions or head over to your favorite app store. We're gonna be doing this in Google Play. Search engraver, and it's likely to be the first one that comes up after the adverts. Select engraver, click install, and let it run. Once the app is installed, simply click open, and the first time you open it, it will ask for certain permissions. The first one is for the location. It requires this in order to use the Bluetooth connection, so we're going to click whilst using the app, and then it will also ask for permission for your media. This is so you can load photographs in off your phone, so we'll click allow. Now make sure your laser is actually turned on, and connection is very simple. In the top right-hand corner, we click not connected, and we'll see the Jinsoku LC40, we click on that, and literally that is as simple as it is to connect your phone to the laser. So the app itself is basic but functional. You've got a couple of options for creating things, as well as a couple of options for importing images or taking photos from your camera. For ease, let's go with text. You get solid or outline, basically filled in text or outline text. So we'll click outline for speed, We'll click on the text and then we'll come up and type in subscribe. You've got a few font choices here to choose from. Actually, you've got quite a few font choices to choose from. Let's go with something that is a bit bolder and we'll click OK. 
Now, this is essentially the canvas or the engraving area of the laser, so you can compile multiple things on here or multiple pieces of text. You then have a couple of choices to enlarge or rotate the text as well. So if I can get my finger to click on these little icons, it is a little bit fiddly if you've got bigger fingers. There we are. And as we can see, as I pull out, it will um, enlarge it, and as I take it in, it will shrink it down. So I will enlarge it slightly. Now, that is once we're, you're happy with the composition of this, we can click on next step. And what it does, it takes you through various stages from basically converting it from editable text into an image. So we've got a couple of extra options at this point, invert, horizontal, flip, a few choices, but we'll continue. Click next step. Now at this point, it has converted it to an image. And we've got a couple of things that we can do here, such as adjusting the width and the height and locking the aspect ratio. So as we enlarge or shrink it, it will keep the proportions the same. Now what I'm gonna do is drag this up to the top left-hand corner because that's basically the starting point for the jobs itself. And we will click next. Now the big difference at this stage, if you are used to using a laser before, is rather than giving you actual speed settings, you get a choice of percentage ratings. So obviously laser power is the same as what you're used to using before, zero to 100%. And if we slide that up and we'll make it something about 70%. Engraving speed, it's no longer based on um, millimeters per minute, it is a percentage. So effectively you've got like 0% up to 100% or no speed up to full speed. So we'll take this down and we'll have this at around 90%. Now, if you are trying to do something like cutting, obviously you've got multiple passes as well. I'm just gonna leave this on one for the moment because basically we're just doing a test cut on some um, plywood. The other thing you can also do here is we'll see at the top it's got material selection. It can give you set defaults depending on what that material actually is. I'll leave it on cork wood now. There's also the option to add material. And what we can do here is insert something like slate, for example, set the power and speeds we need for that, click confirm. And then every time you come to want to do slate, you would just select that from the material selection and it would put your default settings in. And with that done, we simply click start and it will send the job over to the laser. You can hear the laser running in the background, but what we can also see on the app as well is it shows you the progress. It also gives you live feed and speed for the laser power and the speed setting, as well as being able to pause and stop the job. And it's a similar process if you want to do something with images. We can click photo, select an existing image from our library, click complete. It will import it in. Obviously, we can add some text, crop things down, or we can even erase areas from the outside. So let's enlarge the brush size, and we can scribble some of the outside of this image out that we don't want to engrave. So obviously, it can optimize the amount of um, area that's actually being engraved. If you're importing a photo, you don't necessarily need to engrave the whole thing because you can white some of it out. Not exactly the cleanest job, but let's carry on. So we click OK. We'll progress to the next step. Now, as we can see, it's converted it into black and white. If I rotate this around, you know, it's in the correct orientation. So you've got a few different choices. Obviously, you've got like black and white, and you can adjust the contrast of this. Obviously, taking it up too much one way or another will make the image worse. We can go back to having it as grayscale, or we can just have it as an outline. A few different choices, obviously, based on the different options and filters in here, and then things like rotate, invert. So we'll go back and we'll keep this as something like black and white for now. Click on next step. Now what again, it's given us our canvas. We can shrink or enlarge this as we want. Let's take it right up to the top left hand corner again. Different sizes, lock aspect ratio. Click next again. And it takes us back to our power settings and then we can simply click start and get this job going. It also has a smart positioning feature. So if you're trying to align this up to something quite small, on screen, I just have James wrote very small in the corner there. If I click smart positioning, it will frame the object to tell me where it's going to engrave. And as you move it on screen, it will move the laser to adjust as well. So if I drag that down a little bit, So ultimately, making it very easy if you're trying to align something, perhaps trying to engrave pencils, something small, you can adjust it live on screen. Switching the firmware over from the mobile phone to the GRBL setup is relatively simple. 
it's pretty much a couple of clicks. You can find the full setup on the SignSmart website if you want to see it, but it literally takes less than a minute to do. And that's it, it's switched over. Now, I did have an issue doing this on my main CNC PC, that's why I'm doing it on the laptop. But however, this is one of the things of doing pre-production testing is to iron out any bugs like this. So when it goes live, hopefully Science Smart have fixed this. So it's time to put the machine through its paces. Now, if you've seen in my previous videos, we've got a good idea of what a five watt laser is capable of doing. It's going to engrave on a whole range of materials such as slate, leather, acrylics, different plastics, different types of wood, MDF. It is a vast array that you can do with this laser. Cutting capabilities, probably a couple of millimeters worth of plywood, maybe up to five or six if you really pushed it. And also I think it can cut through um, thin acrylic as well. Not clear acrylic diode lasers do not work well with clear acrylic you need to put something on the surface to engrave that so let's get stuck in do some tests with the machine and see what we can get out of it so straight out of the box it is ready to go with your mobile phone so obviously that's the first place i started testing doing a few functions in the app testing how easy the different options are to use text drawing and doing things like importing images. Overall, it is really easy to use. There are a few slight bugs in the app, but ultimately you can take any photograph from your phone and actually engrave it onto material that you want, making this a very portable device that you don't need attached to a computer all of the time. After installing the firmware to run on a PC, the first thing I did was a power scale test. Obviously this tests the speed of the machine versus the power of the laser. And we took this from 1200 millimeters up to 10, millimeters per minute at a scale of 10% up to 100% power. Obviously you can see the graduation going on there in terms of the tones but it does prove that the machine can go up to 10,000 millimeters per minute which is the speed advertised but your working range realistically on wood is going to be much down below the uh, the lower half of this so maybe 6,000 millimeters and below because obviously you want to be able to hit the darker tones that you get around the 100% working area. So I'd probably say this band here is somewhere the ideal range for running this laser on plywood. The next test I did was some shape um, scale size testing. What this basically is, is a square that starts off at 10 millimeters um, square down to 0.5 millimeters square. And the same with a circle, 10 millimeter diameter down to 0.5 millimeter diameter. And a similar thing with the text as well, 10 point all the way down to one point, I think I took it down to. Now the squares have come out pretty well. I can see on the circles there is a flat spot happening, which probably means there's an issue with the belt. I might need to check the tensions on them. The font itself has come out pretty good. It goes down to about four or five point where you will start to struggle to read it below that. I should say that's four or five point text as opposed to four or five millimeter text. Points are smaller, obviously. Points are typically what you would get in des um, desktop editing software. The next thing I moved on to was doing a test on um, a tile which has been painted. So this is often referred as to as the NWT method, the Norton White Tile method. And basically what this is, you coat the tile in a layer of paint and then you burn through that. And as the laser burns through it, it has a chemical reaction with the tile and it basically permanently engraves the tile itself. So these are not actually burn marks, it is actually engraved into the ceramic of the tile itself. Now what we can see graduating from up here, it's got, kind of got a pinky color over on this side and this is where it's just starting to burn through the paint. And then it burns through the paint where it comes to the white color, that's where it's starting to get to the top of the tile. And then as we get to the top, the darker tones, that's effectively where it's having the reaction with the tile and engraving the tile itself. There is a bit of an odd thing going on down here. Usually the darker, um, it should get darker down to the bottom right hand corner like it does on the graduation scale there. But it kind of gets brighter after, after these couple of squares here. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. It may be the way I painted the tile. I was messing about with another area over here and that's similar as well. So as I was spraying, it if I put a lighter coat of paint on this bottom right hand corner that might be why um, this paint is coming out a little bit lighter. So after seeing the flat spot on the circle I checked the tension on both the left and right side of the y-axis and they were actually different so we needed to reset the tension on them. You pop a cap off the corner there are two screws on the top one on the bottom to remove the side plate and there we've got the wheel and the tension in bolts underneath. You simply slacken these off the wheel will move in or out so you can adjust the tension accordingly and then tighten them back up. 
I've set the tension on this now and done it this equal on both sides. If you want more information on setting the tension on belts, check out my video link in the top right hand corner. So at this point, I pretty much just started looking around for things to burn with the laser. Grabbed a piece of cardboard, did a bit, bit of a test on that. Probably burnt the edges a bit too much, but it was nice to try and create a new cool effect. Then I found a sanding block that I had lying about from some of the plywood I ordered. So guess what? Yep, I engraved that as well. Came out kind of funky. We've got some dots going on here where it hasn't burnt all the way through the sanding surface, but it has started to go through to the foam underneath. So that was an interesting experiment. Then I found a piece of stabilised wood that Saint Smart sent me a while back. Guess what? I did exactly the same with that. Chucked that underneath the laser as well to burn. Now, if you're not sure what stabilised wood is, it's kind of where they almost force um, resin through the wood to make it more of a plasticky feel than a actual wood feel. But it came out really good, especially when applying a um, an oil coating over the top of it. It gives it a nice shine and makes all the colours really pop in it. So I figured at this point I should probably take things a bit more seriously and stop just finding things to burn. So I found this template on 3-axis and downloaded it. It's basically multiple parts that you cut out of one sheet of plywood and it makes this great little case. It even has a locking mechanism. There is no glue or anything holding this together. It is all part of the uh, design itself that the little tabs hold everything in place. The, um, the flexible part is done by making multiple cuts through the plywood and that allows it to bend and be flexible. It's a nice little design to use. Obviously you can personalize them, sell them on, store things in them. So yeah, something really cool. We've got a bit of overburn going on. Obviously there's lots of multiple cuts when it does the, um, the flexing area. So that's come out a little bit uh, browny orangey, but that could be cleaned up with a bit of sanding. But yeah, nice little template and a nice little project to output on this machine. I then took inspiration from a lot of designs I've been seeing on Facebook laser groups recently and did this layered laser cut. Now this essentially is six different pieces of plywood, thin plywood, all cut out individually and then glued and stuck down one on top of each other. And the effect you get is really cool. Obviously I've also coloured the different layers of plywood as well to give it more depth. And you can do this with lots of different designs and patterns, mandala patterns, that type of thing. And they could even be made into perfect coasters. Obviously as long as the gaps are not too big this will make a really cool coaster set so time to give a roundup of my thoughts on this machine now let's start with the negatives the when i found out this was coming with a five watt laser i was disappointed the reason being is other manufacturers have moved on doing dual diode lasers with higher watt output sound smart have been in this five watt zone for quite a while so i was hoping that this was going to have a more powerful laser now not everyone needs more power i do fully get that and a five watt laser is capable of doing a hell of a lot of things so it is not something to be sniffed at but as i say it'd be nice if they gave users the option in the near future to purchase this with a higher powered diode laser fitted already now i know why they have done it it's all about price point the the cost of this machine is nearly as much as some of the other manufacturers are charging just for the laser module alone so they've done this and kept it with the 5 watt laser to keep it in a suitable price bracket but as i say hope they give users that option in the future should people want a higher watt laser to attach to it now the other niggle that i've got is the firmware as we saw earlier it is simple to do it's a couple of clicks to switch from a using it for the phone to using it for the pc now i think they could have taken this one step further i think they could have made it so there's a switch on the back or something just to go from phone to pc and the reason why i think that's important is there will be some technophobes out there that are worried about swapping the firmware over thinking it might cause issues so that might put them off purchasing it so if they are going to evolve anything those are the two points that i would suggest that science smart focus on to make this available for more people now with the negatives out of the way let's move on to the positives and well there are a lot We've already seen the styling of this machine is a big step forward. It looks very nice. The cable management on it is great. You've not got anything flapping about and awkward cables getting in the way. The hardware upgrades going up to the linear rails, again, making everything very smooth when it is running. The, the actual, the dual firmware, there is an advantage in that as well. It is nice that people can use this without needing a laptop or PC available with them. So it is going to open it up to a 
whole new market of people that can just want to do things straight off their phone and can do this very quickly. People at craft fairs, that type of thing, it's one less thing to have to worry about carrying and transporting around with you. So that is a really nice feature about it. The high sides as well, there's quite a big gap underneath each side so you can actually get very thick material in there and the laser also raises up quite tight so you can start engraving things like cutting boards, chopping boards, that, those type of things that can be quite thick. You can just slide those underneath, get it engraved and as I say you've not got to worry about balancing the frame around it. The repeat job function as well is also really cool. I haven't kind of featured it in this video because it's very rare I do repeat jobs but the facility to just engrave something, take it off, put a new piece in, press that button and it goes again, it's going to save some people lots of time. And you don't need a PC or phone connected at all because it stores it in the memory of the machine. So in theory, once you've sent the job to it once, you can disconnect your device and just keep doing that job one after another. So yeah, very useful, very time saving feature that is going to be benefit so many people. One thing that nearly went into the dislike pile was the air assist feature, the passive air assist. I'd like the option to be able to fit an air assist this nozzle to my laser and the fact the way they've built this stops you from doing it as I say nearly went into the dislike pile but I took a closer look at the laser and by removing one of the small plates from underneath it you can actually in fact still attach an air assist nozzle so you actually get the best of both worlds you get passive air assist if you don't need to use full-on air assist which still means you get a directional flow of air helping to keep the laser clean if you are doing things like cutting you can attach an air assist this nozzle to it and giving you the option to use that so yeah what was nearly a dislike actually made it something that I really do like because you get both options from the same setup. There are also the little things as well that you almost don't give much thought to but they are really beneficial such as the having the depth stop just as part of the frame so every time you use it, it goes back in that same place you don't have to think oh where did I put it have I left it around the workshop have I forgotten it. It is just those little things that make life so much easier. The spring on the cable so they always retract and are not flopping about. It's one thing having the cables nicely tucked away around the frame but also having the springy cables again just makes everything look that much neater and as I say it stops as much hanging out of the laser itself. So there are tons of little things that they've done on this machine even the way all the edges are round off to make it nice and smooth. It is just a big step forward for Science Smart in terms of the lasers they are producing. It's going to make a lot of people very happy to have this as part of their setup. If you are interested in buying this machine then please do use the affiliate links in the description below. As I always say they don't cost you any extra money. I may just get a tiny little bit back to help keep the channel going. That is everything for today. I really hope you've enjoyed this laser and the review that I've done on it. If you did, obviously, always click like. It helps the channel. Thank you very much for watching. Final thanks always goes to my patrons. I'll see you all on the next episode.